This is the Peak Cast, presented by Strive 365, where we strive to eliminate childhood trauma while equipping youth to become resilient and better our community. We discuss social and emotional issues affecting today's time while bringing you experienced leaders to discuss diverse topics in a fun and informative way. So we're going to jump into our second part of this podcast. Um, thank you guys for uh, listening as well. And I hope you're taking notes down, learning a lot. So uh, we're, the key topic we're going to focus on is relationship building. Um, Strive365, as you know, we are very young, um, but you were one relationship we really feel was very important for us to grow. Um, can you kind of touch on how this relationship came upon um, and not just uh because brandon was the tallest and biggest person in the room so you couldn't uh, couldn't walk away from him yeah so um uh, this is a pre-covid story so i hope you can all go on this flashback journey with me right so brandon and i actually dr curry and i met for coffee oh gosh it must have been almost a year ago um if not before and there were some mutual connections. So talk about relationship, people that thought it would be good for us to talk. And I remember instinctively and automatically saying, this is a partnership we've got to facilitate. There's a couple of reasons for that. And it's just been reinforced with our time with Brandon and Cody and Mel and all of you at Strive365. So if you think about these kids, many of whom are holding their pain all by themselves. And just if people aren't familiar with whether or not trauma is real, whether or not it's significant, impactful and overwhelming, there's a number of places you can go to get perspective on that. Uh, survivors of trauma and their stories, but if you appreciate that, then you start to appreciate one of our fundamental requirements is to get people connected to kids in ways that can help them feel less alone, less crazy when their brain and body do these quote unquote weird trauma responses, right? And so my eyes lit up when Dr. Curry talked about what you all are doing and trying to do. And I just thought of the thousands of kids who love to partake in activity and sport. And I thought, oh my, think of all the lives that can be touched by sharing notes with your team around what people can do. So that began this really remarkable partnership. And we've had, oh gosh, probably 15, 20 interactions since then. We watched Dr. Perry's Neurosequential Model of Sport series together. We've just really done some collaborative sort of uh, foundational work. And I can't compliment enough um, even when I look at the craft banner behind you, let me give you an example of why that's technically sound. So it's a catchy acronym, congratulations. But the idea that relax comes before assess is a really important technical trauma-informed concept. I cannot access the part of my brain that assesses things without relaxing first. So it might have been strategically crafted, pardon the pun, in that way. But uh, regardless, it's one of the many examples that says to me, these folks know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. And therefore, we're invested in a long-term partnership. Well, we, we feel exactly the same, Tim. Uh, we just know that you know what you're talking about, know what you're doing, and you've been doing it for so long. Um, and we just hope to be a part of it. Um, one thing that's really important in life, um, and I, I can speak for myself on that, is I've been very blessed to have great parents and great uh, figures around me, whether that be 
uh, my coach, Coach Allison, whether it be some of the friends I've had. Um, Tim, can you touch on how important it is not to be lonely? A lot of kids go through loneliness and just having uh, the impact of an essential figure, whether that be your parents or that be someone, uh, it doesn't always have to be a parent or a sibling or a relative. How important is that? And um, what's the impact loneliness can have on an individual? Well, great question, Hassan. Let me answer in a couple of different ways. So one of my mentors is Dr. Bruce Perry, who is genuinely one of the world's gurus on this topic. He's an academic, he's a psychiatrist, he's a neuroscientist. He has worked with thousands and thousands of people across the world. So when people like him give you simple conclusions, you pay attention. So here's one of my favorite simple conclusions of Dr. Perry's. Relational wealth is a greater predictor of outcome than adversity. Now, I know that sounds pretty simple, but that's actually a really profound statement to absorb. What it suggests is that even if kids have uh, bad stuff happen to them, if they are supported, connected, sort of uh, persisted with over that time, it will likely mitigate some of the effects of what's happening to them and sort of produce the potential for a better trajectory. So it's really important to think about adversity and trauma and the kinds of experiences people have, but probably even more important is how we get people committed to being in these kids' lives. Here's the trick though. We tried about 20, 30 years ago to solve that problem in, I would call it a quantitative way. What I mean by that is we signed up a bunch of volunteers to sort of connect with kids. The problem is we didn't necessarily give them the technical skills and know-how needed to maintain the connection. So when that kid would push that person away as survivors want to do, they wanna test you and say, look, if I push you a little bit, will you come back? Because when I've pushed people before, they left. And my frame from being burned by that is that's what's going to happen again. So we didn't necessarily prepare all these marvelous people for what they needed to know to stay engaged with these kids long term. Now, if we can remarshal another sort of a groundswell of people who want to get connected to kids, We've got new technology we can teach them that can help them transform some of that resistance they get and produce powerful long-term connections. But there are many out there, Hassan, who would say from an American priority perspective, it may be the single most important thing. Think about that for a minute. Of all the other priorities, people much smarter than me are saying things like the question you're asking may simply be the most important thing we do. And that's why people who do what you do, people who do sort of work with kids are so critical to the success of our country. And, you know, speaking that relationship, relationship piece, um, you know, when I was in high school, you know, you, you know, I didn't really have too many friends and I wanted to play a sport because the fact that, you know, you're part of a team. But um, in uh, my freshman year, my math teacher, he's the head tennis coach. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, you know, hey, you want to play on the tennis team? Um, just randomly asked me. And if he didn't ask me, that would not have created the opportunity for me to meet other people like minded like me that like to participate in a new sport and then eventually grow to different opportunities that I had to scholarships, uh, to qualifying for the state tournament, to you know um, eventually finding this type of organization as well. But um, it, it started with him doing that ask and building that relationship with me and uh, wanting to be there. So um, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy to think how one thing 
just one yeah. small thing, just asking someone to do something can lead to so many different things. And there's a really great video out there, JP, on a drummer by the name of Clint Pulver. I think his last name is Pulver. It's about four minutes long. Um, similar story. He couldn't stop fidgeting in class and he kept drumming on his desk. And one teacher gave him a pair of drumsticks. But beyond the gift of the drumsticks, sort of looked past the difficult behavior and said, I wonder if there's another pathway for you. So I suspect, and we teach this all the time, even though your teacher's invitation to play tennis was as simple as an invite to play tennis, there was probably enough caring in the invitation that you felt that made sort of your willingness to accept the invite more likely. And that's a really important part of this process. It can't just be transactional. We talk about the tagline restoring connections all the time because we've created a world where connection, meaningful, deep, plutonic connection is hard. Technology distracts us. COVID is a sort of new angle that sort of makes it difficult. So part of what we're trying to do is get back to nurturing our greatest gift. We are literally designed to get the best source of pleasure from each other. Not a video game, not our phones, not a movie, not a Netflix show, not a whatever from each other. So how do we collaboratively find our way back to where we're nurturing that gift? You know, speaking of COVID, Tim, um, how do you think the ch the child's experience is changing as they're adjusting from being in person at school and then transitioning to being on this virtual format? How do you think their relationship with their teachers is is being experienced? How do you think their personal how do you think they're being affected? Yeah, so when I hear people who answer this question, I think most try to carefully give a balanced reaction. Like, you know, there are some pros and cons, there are some good things and bad things. I'm not going to do that. My perspective on this is it's unequivocally worse. Are there pockets of kids who benefit from a different platform and the sort of freedom that virtual offers? Sure. But as a whole, make no mistake, in my humble opinion, COVID has made relational process harder. Generally from a big picture point of view. And there is a myriad of ways that happens. So let me give you an example, if you bear with me, this is going to get a little technical. But we all navigate the world with our senses, right? What we see, smell, hear, taste, touch, etc. Most people don't know there are two other senses, what people call proprioceptive and vestibular. Let me give you an example though. When Michael Jordan has to time his jump from the free throw line to make that dunk, <laughs> most sports fans know that visual, right? You probably pulled it up in your head right now. <laughs> Before we got here. Yeah, he's not simply using sight and sort of all that. He's also using a measurement of how, how soon he has to time his jump how high he has to jump. And those are sensory processes more in this proprioceptive vestibular category. I say all that because even if I lean in Hassan and JP to this conversation, it cannot replicate the proprioceptive effect of leaning in if we were talking in person. So People have to understand Zoom and virtual platforms are a nice alternative to nothing, but they do not fully replicate face-to-face -face process. And I worry about that, frankly, all the time because I, I worry we'll create a world where people will see them as a one-to-one -one and they simply aren't. And 
I'm, I'm not a Zoom hater, right? I mean, I, I appreciate like this, the virtue of a, a virtual platform, but we cannot allow ourselves to presume they are akin or equivalent to face-to-face -face interaction. And there's already talk about that. People are saying stuff like, well, we'll never do in-person conferences again. And when I get a little less emotional, when people say stuff like that, I say, just please rethink that sentiment. You cannot replicate having coffee across an open space in a virtual platform. And so if that's true for adults, it's also true for kids. I'd love to find a way to quantify that for you, for you mathematical folks out there. So one hour of a Zoom interaction is 60% of a face-to-face -face interaction or something like that. But I would purely be making stuff up. I would be spitballing. But I think we have to keep that in mind. We have to find a way back to a face-to-face -to -face world, although safely. I'm also not one of these people who thinks COVID is a hoax, et cetera. I think it's real. It's worthy of our sort of uh, prioritization, but let's not confuse virtual interaction for the real thing. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's so funny that you say that. Um, I was back home visiting my family and I was asking uh, my eight-year-old cousin, what's the positives and negatives of, uh, of virtual? And the first thing she said is, can I go to negatives first? And I said, why negatives? <laughs> and she said, because I don't get to see my friends. She said, that that's the one thing I don't yeah. like. I don't get to see my teacher. She says, I just don't like that. Um, and I think that's really important. And however you chalk it up, I think just having someone in person, you get their natural reaction. Um, and I think they just feel more comfortable sometimes. And I think their engagement level is definitely much higher. I, I've seen struggles with uh, Mock Academy of Sciences when we're doing our virtual learning and how the teachers are engaging with the students. Their attention span is not always there. They're distracted, looking somewhere else. You know, they're doing different activities and it's really difficult to do virtual activities to keep them entertained for so long without the right resources on hand as well. But when we're in person, the effect was so great. So now we're in this adjustment period where we're trying to get them engaged as much as possible through a virtual platform, which is challenging, but you know, we, we're trying to head out for, this, for these next pat, for these next eight weeks here. Yeah. yeah, and I don't want to overwhelm our audience with a whole bunch of technical stuff, but survivors of people who've been burned relationally mm -hmm. will tell you that these missing sensory ingredients are essential to detecting threat. So I would hypothesize that part of why people are more fidgety, especially kids and struggling to concentrate, is one of their tools to say, are you safe? Are you a threat? Are you safe or are you threat? Is removed in a virtual world. If you think about it, that makes it harder for survivors to get safe and relaxed and comfortable. Yeah, so and there's a sorry, so I just there's a whole plethora of science behind that I won't bore our listeners with. Um, but trust me when I tell you that it's there, and if people want to know more about that, they can contact you. We'll give them some resources. Uh, sorry, sorry to cut you off there, Tim. Um, I wanted to ask you, Tim. Uh, so you touched on five of our con or our concept that breaks into five things. You use the word stability a lot throughout this, uh, this podcast. Um, can you touch on the five pillars of stability and what their importance is? Um, I think this is a very important concept for the audience to learn. And I don't want to mess it up because I don't know <laughs> about it. So I'd rather hear from an expert who understands it much better. Yeah. So let me think of a really brief way to introduce this context. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of a five-year-old who's experiencing physical abuse from one of his grown-ups, right? Um, and part of how they navigate the world is they ask questions like, why is this happening? And when my brain and body do these weird things, am I crazy? Am I stupid? Am I weird? What do my friends say? 
So part of what helps when they're navigating through all that is to live in a world of relative stability. When the people in their lives have access to affordable housing, to health care, to employment opportunities, to connections of their own, put really simply, they're better able to provide stability for kids. When they don't, when those connections, when those health access, when housing is unstable, it just adds another layer of instability for kids already struggling. So part of our recognition at St. A was we can zoom in on that kid. We really can. We can teach them some things. We can normalize that brain body response, but we're really only doing half the job unless the people in his life don't have some degree of stability. And I say all that, and I have to say, you can't really talk about that with, without talking about equity. What I mean by that is one of the primary reasons why some groups of people have, generally speaking, less stability is because it's been orchestrated and designed to be so. I mean, when you look at how African-American folks, for example, have experienced 400 years of systematic enslavement, lynching, Jim Crow, oppression, et cetera, and then some of the more subtle machinations, redlining, financial assistance, you can't really talk about creating stability through five pillars unless you co-prioritize the goal of equity. Systemic racism, regardless of what you're being told on TV, is a real thing. <laughs> I can't say that loud enough and sort of strongly enough. It's a real thing. At the very least, people can argue you don't perpetuate 400 years accidentally. It requires a lot of effort, a lot of coordination, a lot of systemic thinking. So, um, for us, that's why equity is the first word in our mission statement, because we started to realize, oh, about six or seven years ago, it's kind of the foundational layer to everything we do. You can't really heal from trauma without equity. You just can't. That's a beautiful word. Uh, I, and I definitely know it means a lot to you. Uh, I think. Yeah. If I went back, uh, my the most words I probably used was the word so, and uh, you used equity a lot. <laughs> so really, uh, <laughs> that a lot. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you bring that up, Hassan. Um, I talk about my story sometimes as a, I like to think, big-hearted, conscientious white guy, but that's not enough. It's really not. It requires humbling yourself and learning and experiencing and absorbing sort of in the ways that you can vicariously what truth is. So just being good people, it ain't enough. Agreed. You've got to be good people who understand, who understand at a deep level, and then you've got to work every day to sort of undo some of that systemic process. So it just doesn't mean a great deal to me. It means a great deal to all of us at St. A. So we're, we're coming up to our last session. Uh, it's called Cope It Out. So it's a situational dive of how you coped with a stressful situation. So our COPE, our acronym is communication, offering support, uh, being positive, or how you empowered somebody. So um, just Give, if Timmy, you could provide us a situational dive on how you coped with a stressful situation. Yeah, so let's see, which one should I pick? So um, my work is a little interesting. I spend most of my days talking to people about pain. And uh, trust me when I truly believe that is a blessing, it is one of the true honors of my life. 
but sometimes it gets to be quite a bit because what you'll discover is when you get pretty good at giving people invites to share their pain, they share it, which is awesome. Because it means, especially for kids, they're no longer holding it in isolation. I've got to be mindful though, that I'm prepared for that. And I'm also sort of willing to catch, sorry for that sort of cliche, right? Catch myself when it gets to be too much. And my relaxation strategy is a strategy borrowed from some of the elite athletes of the world. I believe that I can build more stress resilience in my system by doing what Steph Curry and many others are doing, training my central nervous system to be more resilient. So just like a marathon runner can train their lungs and their heart and whatever to be more capable of enduring more marathon, more miles, I'm a believer I can teach my central nervous system to absorb more stress and manage it more effectively. So how do I do that? My belief is that if I can find activities that fully and fundamentally relax me, and I can do them five to seven times a day for three to five minutes. That is my sort of self-chosen dosing for building stress resilience. So there was, I bring up Steph Curry because there was a great article in Outside Magazine a number of years ago about his use of sensory deprivation tanks, which in the trauma world, when we're talking about survivors, we would call a somatosensory regulation strategy. But it turns out these strategies also work for everybody. People with or without trauma histories can benefit from getting their body into a deep state of relaxation, which is not sleepiness, just to be clear. It's the ability to assess, perform, do the things that we want people to be able to do. So part of how I cope is I try to meet my dosing prescription every day of the week. So if you're still with me and bless you if you are, here's what I mean by that. When I walk the dog for a couple of miles every morning, I have a five minute stretch where I synchronize my steps to a count in my head. So when I add that element of rhythm and repetition to my walking, I find that my mind wanders. When my mind wanders, I know I've achieved the central nervous state that I'm after. So that's one activity. When I get home, I use a software called HeartMath to measure whether or not my breathing is getting me the same place, activity number two. So when you start to realize these are pretty easy to access activities, and one more really important point, think of how easy it is to sort of promote these activities in sport. That are natural sort of incubators of doing this kind of work. If my theory is right and my stress resiliency keeps getting better, then we've got a pretty powerful formula. So that's again why I'm really excited about what you all are doing, because even if you screw everything else up, which you aren't, <laughs> but even if you did, just the fact that these kids are engaged in that kinds of sort of body, brain, repetitive activities is worth its weight in gold. That's, uh, uh, it's interesting you said Steph Curry. That's my second favorite player of all time. <laughs> Who's your first, Hassan? Dwayne Wade, gotta be Dwayne oh, Wade. Oh, D Wade, awesome. Um, but yeah, so it's crazy to think, I mean, these athletes are doing things that um, are everyday activities that we could do as well. And it's just building a habit, like you said. Um, so that's beautiful to hear that you have habits that you've built over time. I know it didn't happen just in one day. Um, and then the consistency part, I, I'm yeah. sure that's the most important part for you. And anyone doing an activity is consistency. Um, and I, I'm sure if you miss a day, you think, oh man, like what's missing in my day? What did I forget to do? Um, yeah. And that's how we want these kids to think as well too is, oh, okay. Like if they run through the craft scenario, if they, if they skip the R, 
you can't really get to A because you've skipped an important part. Yeah. Yeah, amen, well said. Um, my dream is of a world where most human beings understand the significance of this and start to practice. Uh, I will not get too carried away, but I think really good things could come from that. That's it. Awesome. Um, so we're getting to almost the hour mark of uh, the Zoom call that we've had. So, Tim, so we appreciate your time here spending with us, me, Hassan, and all the knowledge you have to tell us. Um, so we allow you to do a, we like to call a shout it out. It's a 30 second promotion, letting uh, and the audience know anything about you, your organization, or any shout outs you want to do. So you have 30 seconds. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. So I'm going to go macro on this. I know if people want to become Sane foster parents, they could go to Grow Hope um, as part of our website. Um, so guys, we, we want you to really take away today, um, not just the knowledge, uh, not just the amazing uh, skills that you can develop from relationship building. Just really today, I would love for everyone to take away is how important relationship building is. Um, it sounds like Tim has really taken this time to understand the people he works with. Um, he's really taken the time to break down what the person needs, the concepts that he understands. Um, St. A's has really, really developed over time. And I, I know that it wasn't exactly the same as it's gone, but that's because they've continued to build relationships, whether that be the individuals that they work with, the parents or uh, the partners that they've developed. Um, and it, they have become a big part of this community. Um, so really, I want you to take away that don't be afraid to build relationships with people you don't know. Um, there are times where you are going to get burned, but if you don't take a chance, sometimes you miss out on important people who really do want to help you. Um, and there are people out there who are going to help you, such as Tim, such as Dr. Curry, JP, uh, the whole team of St. A's and the whole team of Strive. So there are times where we know you're going to get burned. Um, it's unfortunate, but just don't put your head down and understand that there are people who are going to help you. And that is going to make a huge difference in your life. And you can continue to do that as well. Once you see how someone can make a difference to you, you have the ability to give back uh, such as Tim has. And Tim, we really are grateful to have you as one of our guests on this episode or for this podcast. I'm sorry. Um, I really appreciate you just sharing really, really deep stories and going deep into your knowledge, uh, going into your bag, I should say. Uh, so thank you so much and uh, we look forward to continuing to see what St. A's is going to do for this community and uh, we, we're very grateful to be a partner of yours. My pleasure gentlemen, thank you very much. Drive 365 coming to you all the way live, checking out. <laughs>